This is DJ Lady Jock from Music My Way, and we have with us today one of the members from the 70s, 60s, 70s funk, soul, pop, rock, what all we could call it, Tower of Power, Mr. Emilio. How are you, sir? I'm very good. Good to be with you. All right. Well, we're going to get started here. So let's talk about you're from Oakland, California. Let's tell us a little bit about Oakland, California. Got a lot of groups that came from out of there as well. Yeah, yeah. You know, back in the 60s, we had Freddie Hughes and uh, uh, Lonnie Hewitt out of there and uh, Faye Carroll. Of course, Sly and the Family Stone came out of there. Tower of Power eventually, um, Cold Blood. A lot of great, great musicians in the Oakland area. The Bay is what we call it, the Bay. So. How did you get the group started? I know we it wasn't always Tower of Power. You guys called the Motown? Yeah, I grew up in Detroit until I was 11. And then my dad moved us out to the Bay Area. And yeah, we got into music when we got out to California. And first, you know, we were just a rock band. But then uh, after that, I, I saw this band called the Spiders. And I also saw Sly and the Family Stone before he ever recorded an album. And uh, just soul music just completely consumed me. And I decided I'm going to make my band a soul band. I hired a couple of horns. And um, my mother said, you know, if you could, me and my brother were in the band and we're both from Detroit. She said, if you're going to play soul music, you should be called the Motowns, you know. And so we were the Motowns and we wore little pinstripe suits and, you know, had little razor cuts and we're all, you know, little sharp guys trying to be, look like soul, soul band, you know. <laughs> and then uh, we met the first hippie we ever met was this guy, Stephen Kupka. And uh, today we know him as the Funky Doctor. And uh, he came in the band and, you know, he had been a roadie for a famous band called The Loading Zone. And they had played the Fillmore West several times. And that was really the thing by then. Everybody was trying to get into the Fillmore. So we decided we're going to change our name, and grow our hair out and start dressing like the rest of the folks. And... Uh, we got an audition at the Fillmore, and by God's grace, uh, we got signed by Bill Graham. Wow. That was what, San Francisco Records he had? Yeah, San Francisco Records. He had two labels. Okay. He had San Francisco Records that distributed by Atlantic, and he had Fillmore Records distributed by Columbia. And everybody, everywhere, was trying to get on those two labels. People were flying in from Texas and Florida, Chicago, <laughs> New York, you know, from Europe. Everybody wanted to be on those labels because Bill Graham was the hottest, you know, rock and roll promoter in the world. And somehow <laughs> he liked us. Uh, you know, he, he liked, I was like rhythm and he always liked horns. And he saw us play and the next thing I know, we got signed to a record deal. Okay, so were you still the Motowns when you got signed to the record deal or did you change the name yet? We had, we had changed the name uh, August 13th, 1968 was uh, Doc's first gig. And shortly after that, we changed the name to Tower of Power. And within a year, we auditioned at the Fillmore West. Uh, we were called back, we offered a record deal, made our first recording, East Bay, Greece, and we were off and running. I appreciate that. Uh, so Rufus, at the time, Rufus Miller was your singer because we hadn't got to Lenny yet. So Rufus was the leader. I mean, singing a lot of the lead songs then. He was the lead singer. And um, mm -hmm. I saw him with a local band called The Magnificent Seven. And, uh, you know, we wanted a, a, a girl. Hmm. And we could, because, you know, the Loading Zone and, and the Spiders, they had, you know, the Spiders had Trudy Johnson, the Loading Zone had Linda Tillery, Cold Blood had Lydia Pence. So we were looking for a girl, but uh, this little short, just ferocious lead singer was singing with this group called the Magnificent Seven. I said, you know, why don't we give him a try? And he came in the band. He was with us for a few months. Mm -hmm. And then he vanished. And it turned out that, you know, he had been doing some drug dealing on the side. And he got into a, you know, a, a beef with the uh, Black Panthers. And he left town, went up to Vancouver. We were like, you know, well, and then we're going to keep moving forward. And uh, next thing you know, he shows up about three, four months later. So yeah, I'm back. Everything's cleared up, you know. And... Uh, he became our singer, and he's the guy that sang at our first audition at the Fillmore West. Wow. So 
You had Rufus. Then we had Rick. Rick Stevens, yeah. Okay. Rufus Miller, you know, he he was kind of a troubled guy back then. Mm -hmm. And uh, drug problems and just, you know, smoked a lot. And so mm -hmm. he, he wound up getting nodes on his throat. And he had to have an operation. And we knew Rick Stevens from this other band called Stuff. Really good little soul band called Stuff in, in Oakland. And, uh, and we asked Rick if he would fill in while Rufus was recovering from his operation. And it took Rufus a long time because he didn't pay attention to uh, his recovery instructions. <laughs> and uh, so we, we used to do five sets a night back then. And so Rick was a real seasoned veteran and he would do all five sets. And then when Rufus was ready, he started coming back, but he would only do like one, sometimes two sets and Rick would do the other three. And mm -hmm. we became really close to Rick and we kept having problems with Rufus. And finally one night, uh, Rufus demanded twice the money and all this stuff. You know? and so I go, well, Rufus, this is a band. I go, we all make the same thing. You know, and he said, well, you know, I'm not going to be there if I don't get twice the money. I said, well, I'm leaving for the gig now. I hope I see you there. But if I don't, oh, well. And we, I got there. I told Rick, I said, this is your opportunity to bring it tonight, man. And we were playing with Cold Blood, I remember. And they were really a big, famous hippie soul band back then. And, Mm -hmm. They were they were the main competition. We were the little puddly little local guys, you know. <laughs> and uh, I told Rick, I go, you gotta you gotta bring it tonight, man. Boy, he owned it. And the next day, I I got a call from Rufus. He goes, oh, look here, man, we need to bury the hatchet. <laughs> and I was like, what? <laughs> and he goes, well, you know, I mean, I'm the lead singer. I go, yeah, no, you were, <laughs> but you're not anymore. And after that, we went with Rick Stevens, and we wound up going to uh, Memphis, Tennessee. And Steve Cropper produced our uh, second album, Bump City. Steve Cropper, of course, produced Otis Redding and Sam and Dave and Eddie Floyd. He wrote Midnight Hour and Dock in the Bay. He was a real famous record producer, songwriter, guitar player. He produced Bump City, and uh, we had a huge hit with uh, You're Still a Young Man, and Rick Stevens was the vocalist on that song. So was that true? That song was actually about a relationship. Uh, he was involved. Actually, it was me. Yeah, I, I that was wrote, you. Yeah, I you wrote, wrote the song. I wrote the song with uh, Stephen Kupka, the Doc, my partner Doc. Okay. And, uh, it was the first song we ever wrote, and I was eighteen, and uh, I had a girlfriend that was twenty-four years old. You know, that was a big deal back then. It's like you know. To be right. with a woman six years older than me, like, you know, and, and we were having this really torrid love relationship and she broke up with me and mm. it broke my heart, you know, oh. and then, and then, you know, uh, she'd be telling me, you need to be with, you know, uh, girls, your, your own age, you know, and I'm like, no, I don't want to, I want to be with you, you know, and <laughs> we end up getting back together and breaking up again. So when we finally sat down to write our first song, Doc says, what do you want to write about? And I said, well, what if we wrote a story about a, you know, a guy that's going with an older girl and she keeps <laughs> telling him, you're still a young man, baby, don't waste your time with me, you know, be with some girls your own age. And he's going, no, 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 no. It's all about you, baby, you know. And so uh, <laughs> that, was, that was the first tune. Wow. So we seem like we're going up the ladder here. So Lenny Williams. How do I get Lenny Williams? Well, Lenny Williams actually came out to Fremont, California where I, you know, I first auditioned Doc and, you know, when we, when we first started out, we lived out there and we used to practice in my dad's garage. And we got a gig in Fremont at this nightclub called George's Palace. And we were, like I said, we were looking for a girl and there was this really good singer named Maxine Howard. And uh, mm. I invited her out. She came out and she was telling me, you know, I can't really do the gig with you guys, but you should hear this guy. And it was Lenny Williams. And he sang really great, but, you know, young and dumb as I was, uh, you know, I just was like, no, we're looking for a girl, you know. Mm -hmm. But I never forgot this guy. He really had some kind of voice. And then, you know, about, I guess, five years later, uh, I'm in my early 20s, and Larry Graham calls me up. Wow. From Graham Central Station. He says, you know, I'm doing a record on this guy. And I wonder if you'd come over and put some horns on it. So we go over there and uh, 
there's these two guys. It's Larry Graham and this other guy. You know, back, I don't know if you remember back then, Sly and the Family Stone, they always wore those big wigs, you know? Yeah. And, mm-hmm. uh, and so, you know, I'm listening to the music and it's all the songs from the first Graham Central Station record. You know, uh, People and uh, 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 what was the other one? Well, uh, uh, Hair, so. you know, all those yeah. songs from the first Graham Central Station record. But it, he hadn't even formed that band yet. He was doing a solo production for Lenny Williams. And I didn't know who Lenny was because he had this wig on. And, uh, but I'm hearing these vocals and these tracks, you know, Larry Graham slapping bass, and just really soulful tunes, you know. And then we took a break and we went out into the kitchen because we were recording at Larry's house. Mm-hmm. And, and Lenny comes up to me and he says, uh, he calls, he says, Mimi. And that's my nickname, you know. Okay. And, and I, I'm looking like, how does this guy know my nickname, you know? <laughs> And he goes, uh, it's me, Lenny Williams. And I go, I didn't remember his name, you know? And he goes, uh, you probably don't remember me because he says, uh, I came out to audition for you guys, but you didn't, you wanted a girl singer. And I auditioned for you guys in Fremont. And I look at him and I go, and he goes, you probably don't recognize me. Uh, you pulled off this wig. <laughs> he goes, I got this wig on. He goes, all these guys wear these wigs. So I go, right. oh man, I remember you. So. <laughs> So we became really good friends. And then what happened is Larry and him had a, a beef over the uh, the writing of the songs because Lenny helped mm-hmm. write all those songs. And so they fell out and, uh, and Larry decided to just make a band and he called it Graham Central Station. He took Lenny Williams' lead vocals off. You can still hear Lenny singing in the background on the, on the background wow. vocals. But, uh, you know, he, he redid all those songs with his own vocal and everything. But me and Lenny had become friends, and he lived right near us in Oakland, because by then I had moved into Oakland with Doc. Mm-hmm. And uh, and we, we, we would hang out. And then we started having problems with Rick, kind of like what we went through with Rufus, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, two times I, I, I asked him, I said, you know, would you come in the band? We're really having problems with Rick. Would you come and be our lead singer? And he knew Rick really well, and he was friends with all of us. So he didn't want to come between us. So he said, nah, you guys, you know, I can't do that, you know. And uh, But the third time, Rick really stepped out. And, and I told the guys, go, we got to get a singer. And I called Lenny. I go, look, I'm getting a singer. I want it to be you. But if it ain't, I'm getting somebody else. And he said he rolled over in bed to his wife, Pearl. And he said, I think he's serious this time. I'm going to do it. And we had already recorded the whole album, the one with What Is Hip on it. Yeah. We, had, we had recorded all the songs, but we hadn't put any vocals on because Rick wouldn't record until we had everything on. And then he threw a big tantrum in the studio. So we got a whole album. And uh, But I had written So Very Hard to Go, and I had already written a few songs with Lenny, and, uh, and I had his voice in my head. So when I wrote So Very Hard to Go, I was thinking like that, that, oh, you know, I, I was always <laughs> like, you know, and... Uh, so I said, let's bring Lenny in. We'll have him sing so very hard to go. That'll be a single. And that'll give us time to teach him all the other songs and finish mm-hmm. the album. And we did that. And the single took off one of the biggest records we had. And he became our lead vocalist. Now, how long did he uh, uh, sing with you guys? Uh, two, three years. Okay. He was a solo artist, you know, even before he was with us. Mm-hmm. Jerry Wexler had signed him to Atlantic. They were going to make him like the the male Aretha Franklin, you know. Oh wow! <laughs> but they, they did uh, they did a cover of the Stylistics tune. Uh, People make the world go round, but they kind of did it to a funk beat. It was really lame, and uh, it didn't work. And uh, so Lenny was just kind of left out, hanging. Nothing was happening. He came in the band, and we took off. Wow! So how many originals besides you are still with the group? Two others. Okay. Yeah, Doc on baritone saxophone. He's my, my main songwriting partner. And okay. David Garibaldi on drums. Drum. Yeah. And we had a, we had a, a fourth guy, uh, mm-hmm. Francis Rocco Prestia, who played with me since I was 14. Uh, wow. he, he was in the band until uh, last year, but he passed away. Okay. Yeah, David played with a lot of heavy hitters, too. Uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, artists as well. Uh, I guess he was back and forth with you guys, right? Because he played well with like six, seven artists, different artists. David Garibaldi played, was in the band four times. This is the fourth <laughs> time he's been in the band. 
The last time he was out of the band, he was out 18 years. Wow. I always tell people, he came back in 1998. I think he's staying this time. <laughs> and, you, and you held on to him. <laughs> wow. We were um, all pretty crazy back then, you know? And he couldn't yeah. stand watching us kill ourselves, you know? So he kept leaving, but then he'd miss us. So he'd come back, but we'd still yeah. be crazy. So he'd leave, then he'd come back, you know? And finally, I sobered up in the late 80s, and Doc got sober a year later, and we got on the spiritual path, and... Uh, and then we we invited him back in in 1998, and uh, yeah, that's a family man. We love him. Since you brought it up, because you was like, well, well, back then, yeah, we was killing ourselves, and Dave came and went. He was gone five years, and this and that. But today, uh, in January of 2017, he got hit by a train. Yeah. We were doing a gig in uh, downtown Oakland, uh, near Jacqueline and Square, at a place called Yoshi's. And we had actually, we had, we had agreed to do the longest run there that we had ever done. We usually did eight shows in a week. You know, we would do uh, two shows a night and then take a day off and do two more shows for the next two nights. And then we, we actually did uh, 10 shows one time, you know, but this time, we agreed to do 12 shows and we sold out all 12. We had completed 10 of them and we we're on the last night and David and the bass player who became our, our bass player now, Mark Van Wagen, we we'll call him VW. Him and VW were uh, crossing the railroad tracks with about eight other people. Everybody crosses the railroad tracks there because uh, you know it, it always goes really slow and there's no, um, there's no, uh, you know, hindrance to it. And so they're waiting and uh, and then the train goes by and they step forward, but another train came the other way. What? And uh, the people behind were kind of Ooh. pushed off and David jumped back and Mark jumped forward, but the train got them both. And uh, very close to death, really close to death. Oh. And oh they were both out for the better part of a year. And it was a scary time, but God brought us through. And uh, now David's back and Mark's the permanent member. So it all worked out. <laughs> wow. Wow. That's crazy. Mm -hmm. Late 70s came. And what is this I hear about you trying disco? <laughs> we were forced to uh, try redoing a, uh, a Motown track. You know, back then, disco was the thing. And everybody was trying to do, do whatever they can to have a disco hit. And a lot of people took Motown songs and redid them to a disco beat. So we were with CBS, which, you know, they were never a very good record company for us. And, uh, and they're, you know, but they gave us a ton of money. I mean, a ton of money, you know? Hmm. And so, you know, when they're asking you to do something, of course you want to please them. And so they said, you know, uh, could you try to sound like the other bands on the radio? You know, because we, we never did, <laughs> you know, we didn't sound like the other bands, you know, and uh, they said, if you could try to sound like the other bands on the radio, we could get you more airplay. And maybe you should redo a Motown song, uh, disco style, you know. So, you know, we agreed to try it and uh, all, all that, have, no matter what we do, we sound like Tower of Power, you know. And so it just kind of came out like a bastardized version of Tower of Power. It didn't work. And then, uh, you know, a couple of years later, uh, we couldn't even get a record contract. They, would, they had us labeled as dinosaurs and their music would never be popular again. And, you know, wow. other guys that go, you know what? Let's just make the music the way we make it. And uh, we, we, we've always stuck to that, that maxim. You know, we make the music to please ourselves. And when we do that, for some reason, it pleases our fans, you know, and it's been uphill ever since. And, uh, even those records that we did, you know, that our hearts were, were really in the way uh, the, the company was, you know, making us lean towards, even those records, we sound like Tower of Power, you know. We had, a, we had a singer in the early 90s, Tom Bowes, and he used to say, you guys could play the phone book and it would sound like Tower of Power. <laughs> so, you know, but we found out, you know, that it's not a, we used to think it was a curse, you know, that we didn't sound like the other bands. And what we found out later on was it's a blessing because we got our own identity, our own voice, our own signature.
that's the good thing. And that that's that's pretty much how music was used to be. You can tell a band or group by its identity, you know. Well, but you know, if you think about it, it's always been like that. You know, back in the 60s, uh, Motown would put out a hit, and then they put out another release that sounded like the hit, <laughs> you know, and just trying to ring the bell as many times as they could, you know. And uh, people are going to do whatever they can to make money. It's about the buck. And that's why they say music, business, <laughs> you know. So they're out there trying to get the buck, but I, I'm a firm believer that there's always good music and there's always junk, you know. And uh, the young people always find the good music, and uh, but the junk will always be there. And uh, But if you listen close, even today, there's lots of great artists, lots of great singers, lots of great bands, lots of great music, you know. And it's easy to stand back and go, well, it ain't as good as it was back in the day, but, you know, 20 years from now, this is going to be back in the day. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, I think they haven't. They what's going on is they having the same problem that groups like yours had in the seventies. They're not getting the radio or airplay. Yeah, but you know now it's a completely different ballgame because there hardly is no radio. You know everything's streaming now. You know and they don't sell many. And you know. I think if somebody put out a statistic the other day, they said 50% of the record sales were vinyl, you know, and hardly anybody even has a CD player anymore. And, but most of the, the royalties that we as artists are making comes from streaming, you know, and most of that streaming is done by young people. <laughs> so <laughs> it's just a different ball game. That's all. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the same thing's happening now that happened to us. The record companies are leaning on the artists to try to do this and try to do that because they think they know what's best for their artists. And, you know, I don't blame them. They're putting a lot of money into the artists. But in truth, if you're an artist, you know what to do with your music and you should just move forward and do it. Sometimes that's a learning process. Oh, oh Lady Jock, I don't know if you know of this movie, but um, it's, it's a great movie. It's based on a true story. It's called City of God. Yeah. And when I saw that movie years ago and I heard so very hard to go in this movie made in Brazil. I believe that was Brazil they was in. Yeah. Um I was like, wait a minute. Okay, that so to me I was looking at like, so that song went international, you know, <laughs> basically. That's a crazy a crazy movie, but it's a good movie. You know, but that was a lot of years ago, you know, and uh, and I, you know, and back then there weren't as many international deals like that going on. And I remember our publishing lady, she was like, That's a little movie out of Brazil, let's just do whatever deal we can, and that'll be that. Well, we should have made a bigger deal because <laughs> that movie's been playing for that's, years, yes, you know? that's but a, we still yeah. get royalties from it. But I mean, even today, I got an email this morning, and uh, the Netherlands, you know. They're, they're, they got some kind of TV show or movie or something going on in the Netherlands, and they're going to use Soul with a capital S. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I get lots of different uh, offers from uh, France or Italy where they're using What is Hip or You're Still a Young Man, you know. So these days, because of the Internet, it happens more, and that's great for us as songwriters. In 2020, your album Step Up, you came out with. In 2021, you came out with your 50 years of funk and soul. Over 50 years, you've been doing this. You know, you're still out there doing your thing. How, I mean, I know you said that you're just being you. That's what keeps you going. Just doing, doing Tower of Power and not trying to do or catch up or be like anybody else. Yes. How does that make you feel as as a, a young coming up as a young musician with a dream and over 50 years later still be able being able to do what you always wanted to do your way? Well, it's a privilege, it's a blessing, and I had nothing to do with it. <laughs> you know, I tell people, God did it, I just showed up. I mean, there is no other explanation. In my first 20 years. We made every mistake known to man as a, as a collective band of men. I mean, we lived wrong. We, we, we squandered money. We, we just, we, we could blew it in every way possible, but God had a plan for us, you know? And like I say, I got sober in 88. 
Doc got sober in 89. I started hiring people that were principled. We started praying together. As soon as we did that, everything changed. It, you know, so it's a blessing and a privilege from God. And there's no other explanation. I mean, we have longtime fans, but we have gathered new fans along the way. And now, you know, these days, all these young kids come to see us. I remember I was in Seattle and uh, these six young 16 year old girls came to the dressing room. Me and Doc were in there and they go, you know, we're here to see you tonight. We're going to be here three nights in a row. We drove down from Vancouver. That's a four and a half hour drive. You know, we're wow. staying here for three nights to watch, you know, all your shows. And I looked and I go, how did you get hip to Tower of Power? <laughs> you know, I mean, they're 16 years old, you know, and they go, our band teacher, our band teacher told us about you guys. You know, I started thinking about it. There were a lot of men and women that played music, that wanted to be professionals, that didn't make it in the business as professional exactly. touring, you know, entertainers, but they became educators. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, these educators, like, you know, they're teaching these kids in marching band, stage mm -hmm. band, these mm -hmm. various ensembles. And, you know, what would you like? If you're in a marching band, what do you want to play? John Philip Sousa? Or what is hip? You know, it's a no brainer, you know. So we got all these, you know, second generation people telling the third generation, check mm -hmm. this out, you know, and these kids are going nuts, you know. And then the other thing is, the band has always been known by musicians and you know and musicians like all you got to do is whisper something it's immediately known by every musician in the world <laughs> we're like gossip hounds you know and so you know people start talking about us and we become like the musicians musician band you know we're out there playing and 80 percent of the audience is former musicians or current musicians you know and they're all just checking us out all the sax players are here all the drummers are here all the trumpet players over here the bass players are over here you know and uh for some reason you know that exponentially grows you know musicians have kids <laughs> kids learn to play music and the next thing you know they're coming to tower power shows we um really oh, well really appreciate you taking the time to for this interview and um we just looking looking forward to seeing you i appreciate you guys thanks for having me today and look forward to coming to st louis and bringing the house down <laughs>